Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, important and timely event. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the chief executive of the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees. And it's a great pleasure to once again join forces with insiders, insider outsiders to bring you another fascinating insight into history, uh, this time with the remarkable and intimate diary entries of Marie Panath in her book, Rock the Cradle. For those of you who do not yet know the AJR, uh, we are the national organization which represents and supports Holocaust refugees and survivors. And we provide social welfare uh, and where needed financial assistance to refugees and survivors. And so if you or anyone you know uh, could benefit from our services, please do let us know. Uh, it's obviously a very critical and sensitive time that we're in touch with as many people as possible who might benefit from our services. The AGR is also the largest benefactor of uh, projects and programs relating to Holocaust education and memorialization. And alongside the proposals we support, we have also, and we are still accumulating our own testimony collections through the AGR's Refugee Voices and My Story, which like uh, Rock the Cradle, capture for posterity and study, as well as uh, personal fascination, the eyewitness accounts of those who experienced Nazi oppression. Uh, and these first-hand accounts are so invaluable as a resource to combat anti-Semitism and the growing phenomenon of Holocaust distortion. This year, and indeed this month, the AGR is marking two very special milestone anniversaries. Uh, this month is the 75th anniversary of the publication of the first AJR journal, AJR Information, as it was then, uh, in January 1946. And then this coming July, we mark the 80th anniversary of the AJR itself, established by the refugees following the government's decision to reverse the policy of internment. And I know, too, that this month marks the milestone anniversary uh, for some of the survivors who came to Lake Windermere. I'm sure that's something that will be discussed during the event this evening. The refugees and the survivors have more than given back to the country and the communities into which they found themselves. And so it is with great pleasure that I welcome our guests uh, this evening uh, and to hand over in a moment to uh, my colleague, Monica von Duchen, to uh, be in conversation with them. Just a quick word on some housekeeping. The event this evening is being recorded. We do like to see as many faces on screens as possible. So if you are able to uh, keep your camera on, that would be great. But uh, in case you want to be, uh, remain anonymous, the, um, the option is there, but the event will be recorded and it will be available to see again on the AGR's YouTube channel in a couple of days. We've also, as you can see, muted all the uh, audience, except for the speakers, obviously, and that's just to save on the background uh, noise uh, that, that may occur. But if you did have a question for our speakers, then drop it into the chat function at the bottom of the screen that, and direct it for Monica's attention, and she will pick it up and endeavor to capture as many uh, comments and feedback from the audience as possible. And so with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Monica to be in conversation with Henry Hochland and Trevor Avery uh, and look forward to another fascinating and illuminating event. Monica, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Well, it is indeed my very great pleasure too to welcome you to the first of the joint events between Insiders Outsiders, of which I'm the director, and the AJR for this troublesome year, hopefully, which will improve greatly as time goes on, 2021, and there will be more to come, so look out for those. Um, I think without further ado, I'm actually not going to be quite in conversation, although I will kind of set the ball rolling, I suspect, after Trevor and Henry have had their say, but um, we have agreed between us that Trevor Avery will speak first, telling us um, about, well, the rather extraordinary story of how these journals came to be discovered and indeed to be published, uh, with many other 
fascinating uh, issues discussed along the way, I have absolutely no doubt. And then we'll um, hand over to Henry Hochland, with whom Trevor has recently gone into partnership to create what sounds like an absolutely wonderful and truly worthwhile publishing endeavor known as Second Generation Publishing. So I think without further ado, um, I will begin by introducing the two speakers, starting with Trevor. Um, as many of you will already know, he's the director of an extraordinary and heartrending and really important project called the Lake District Holocaust Project, which actually was founded in 2005 and has been in, based in Windermere in the beautiful Lake District, of course, since um, 2010. He's been an advisor on a number of uh, national television and radio programs, uh, including the 2020 Pre-Europa award-winning BBC and Warner Brothers drama, The Windermere Children, which I think really did forever, didn't it, spread the word to a huge number of much, much broader section of the population about this extraordinary history. And he also makes an appearance in the accompanying BBC documentary entitled The Windermere Children in their own words. He's also appeared in BBC Radio 4 documentaries, including Open Country, The Windermere Boys, and in a special edition of BBC Radio 4's Sketches. Other programs include ITV's the story of the swastika and the 2010 BBC One documentary entitled The Orphans Who Survived the Concentration Camps. Now that's basically what Trevor <laughs> said to me by way of official bio, but I'd like to add, add because I know Trevor well enough to know that he's far too modest to tell the world that he was awarded in 2016 the British Empire Medal for his services to heritage and gosh the amount that's contained in those few brief words um, I think we'll begin to discover for ourselves as he begins to talk. I'll also now, I think, uh, say some words about Henry, who will be talking primarily about the reasons for founding this wonderful publishing project towards the end of the session. Again, in his own words, um, Henry Hochland was born into the world of books. His late father, about whom Henry will undoubtedly say more, was a Holocaust survivor. He set up the respected sort of starting, you know, establishing himself in the new country. He set up the very, very respected university bookshop in Manchester called Haig and Hochland. Uh, Henry himself started publishing in the mid 1980s and has produced over 200 books across a very wide spectrum of subjects. He set up a company called I Nostalgia, which produces weekly supplements for both the Manchester Evening News and the Liverpool Echo. And as a result of this work, about which maybe he'll tell us more, a responsibility emerged with every memory evoked. And as you can see here, this is not a normal bio. I, I very touched, Henry. I must say that what you sent me is, is very personal, so I'll, I'll carry on. So a responsibility emerged with every memory evoked and every comment received. It was a feeling of duty to the past to preserve it as a living legacy. As a result, he's developed the charity dedicated to that living legacy called the Nostalgia Trust, and there's information about that online. And then finally, on researching, last but certainly not least, on researching his own family's journey, he recognised the, the need to facilitate other stories to be told, learning from the past and educating future generations. Many people have since contacted him from around the globe to help them on their own journey of reconciliation. And I have absolutely no doubt, Henry, and I know we discussed this informally last week, that you will be inundated by people coming to you in the wake of this session, which I very, very much look forward to. So I think without further ado, Trevor, over, over to you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um speaking from a very wintry Lake District at the moment, um, wet and wintry rather than snowy. Um, so where do we begin? A very brief overview of, of how I became involved. Um, in 2005, I curated an exhibition um, to commemorate at that time, the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And it was a small exhibition in a small market town of Kendall uh, with other events going on. And it was about the flying boat factory that once stood in the Lake District on the shores of Windermere, uh, the largest single span building in Europe at the time. And we thought that was quite a story to tell until um, a couple of gentlemen came into the exhibition and were pointing at a map, a Ministry of Air Production map, um, of Calgarth Estate, which is where the workers stayed, who were brought to the Lake District to work the factory. Mm. And one of them simply said, um, in the course of the conversation, of course, you know, this is where the children from Auschwitz came. And I, of course, I didn't know, and, and I was slightly taken aback. 
and this gentleman began to describe um, some of the conversation events that he'd come across with these children. So to cut a very long story short, I, I, I sort of tried to seek out these children and, and my first port of call um, through contacts was with uh, Sir Ben Halfcott. And he was probably the very best first contact I could have had with any of the boys because Ben was absolutely terrific. Um, I said to him, I'd like to talk to you about um, your life and your times in Windermere. And his, uh, his response, you mean Wondermere? So that was a sort of pushing at an open door. He arranged for me to meet three of the survivors in Manchester. Uh, they became known to us colloquially as, as the Three Amigos. And it was Maya, Hirsch, Jack Eisenberg and Sam Laskier. And the range of experiences just between those three was extraordinary. You know, it was Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Warsaw Ghetto, you know. Um, but I was taken by the fact that the meeting went on for five hours in the Midland Hotel Manchester. And, uh, but only the final half an hour was actually about the Holocaust and the lives. The first four and a half hours were talking about Windermere, about jokes, about laughter. And I thought this is not what I expected. That these these three friends obviously they were in their mid seventies then had an enormous loss for life uh, a, a spark that came up Ben Ben had warned me beforehand that when when you meet the boys if you want any information from them just talk to one at a time because if you get more than one or a group of us in a room we revert back to teenagers in Windermere again and so I evidenced this or this first meeting. Um, so we set about collecting the stories of, of the children who've been in Windermere, but also the local community, many of who were still living there from the flying boat factory time, their stories and what they remembered of the children in Windermere. Um, this went on for, the momentum was quite extraordinary. Within five years, we had the documentary on BBC One. Uh, which we thought was the pinnacle of what we could do to have the, the, the story known nationally. Um, but then in 2016, 17, we were approached by um, uh, Walter Wall, who had been commissioned to, by the BBC to look into making a programme, a television documentary initially, um, about the guys and their time in Windermere. Um, so we began the discussion with them, the Downing Street was involved, the Holocaust Commission, everything even at that time was geared towards 2020 and the 75th anniversary events. So this is how long the, the process was before the Windermere Children, a documentary came about. And um, we had Simon Block was terrific, uh, Nancy, all the guys were terrific. They came up to, to Windermere, a representative of the Holocaust Commission came up. We had more than enough material then to make a documentary and the attention quickly shifted to making a drama about it, a full length drama. And, and this was well underway, believe it or not, there had been some, uh, scripts and screenwriting had already gone on. Two scripts had passed before us. And then actually, so when Monica comes into the story, um, I went on a visit from Windermere to London and I met Monica um, and we chatted about inside or out, outside the, the, the initiative. And then I came back to Windermere and an email from Monica dropped onto my, onto my desk. And it said, um, I've been asking around, chatting and everything. And it said, I've come across this, uh, it's not there, death. Um, have you heard of her? And I have to say, I hadn't. Um, and he said, I think she was in Windermere. Uh, at the very same time, my colleague Rosemary had chatted to somebody who'd been a, a cook from London, and she'd been brought up to Windermere to cook for the, for the guys. And she said, this cook has just told me this story about the extraordinary woman called Marie Paneth. Who, who taught English. And so the two of us came together at the same time with this mysterious name. So I said to Roger, well, shall we try and track any history of Marie Dow? Um, we fetched up in the US Library of Congress. We found uh, an archive there um, in the Freud archives. And there was um, 
a file on Marie Paneth, but you can imagine our surprise, given that we were well on the way to helping War to Wall and the BBC and Warner Brothers make this film that was pretty well set in motion, we uncovered a file called the Windermere Reception Camp. And we asked Meg uh, McAlee, who's the professor there in charge of this, could, could you let us know what is in this file? You know, And she wrote back and she was very, very helpful. And she said, well, there are there seems to be some pictures, uh, some drawings by children. Um, and there seems to be uh, a press release from uh, an event at the Museum of Modern Art. But she said, there is a book, there is a draft of a book, and it seems to be called Rock the Cradle. And it seems to be about life in Windermere Reception Camp. So we said, well, could we have a copy of it sent to us digitally? Which she arranged for that to come. And if I tell you that, that we, um, we were absolutely astonished at what this book, this eyewitness account written very, very shortly after Windermere, um, it was something that we'd been looking for. Uh, we had a jigsaw, we had two stories, two parallel stories. We had the local community who worked at the factory, worked at Calgarth, and some of them remembered the children and some of the liaisons that went on. We had the children, the boys and the girls stories, we collected many of those, and their stories of arriving and being in Windermere. But we didn't have, uh, if you like, an independent sort of third party observer who watched both, who could look on the entire scene and talk about the local community and the Jewish children and how they came together. So for us, the discovery of Marie's book was absolutely off the scale. And I, I contacted Wall to Wall and I said, look, I think we need to just hold off a moment on the scripts. I think there's something you might be interested in reading. And of course, we sent it through to the guys and they immediately, Simon, the writer, and everybody immediately made room in what was to become the Windermere children drama. They made room for this, this character called Marie Paneth, uh, who was played by Romola Garay. Um, and the book, we determined at that point that it would be a terrific um, opportunity for us to commemorate the 70th anniversary if we could get the book published. Um, it's a very, very abbreviated version of what happened, but we were taken by some of the things that Marie um, talked about. She was very, um, very considered. There was a lot of self-reflection in the journal, in the book. She came, she came from a, uh, she came, she, she was asking questions of herself as much as she was asking questions of the children of the local community. It's interesting when, when we see that she, in the initial pages of the book, she's concerned about, in the event there were 35 helpers who came up, led by Oscar Friedman, Lena Montefiore, but 35 helpers who, who arrived two or three weeks earlier to prepare these empty hostels on Calgarth Estate. The empty hostels because the, the, the workers who arrived was the factory and attached stayed there. But the local community was still around. The, the houses, these, these hostels were in the centre of this, this community of, of families. So there were roughly maybe, you know, 1,500 people still living there when the guys turned up to prepare the ground for, for the Jewish children arriving. So she was very, very aware. They, they had meetings with the locals to try and explain to them what, who they were, what we were doing. She, we were very aware that we were intruding into their lives if you like and and she said to them very tellingly please bear with us about these children that are coming um we don't know what we're taking on we have to be open with you we don't know what their personality are going to be like we we can tell you a little bit about what they've lived through but we know as little as you do so if there is any any sort of issues that arise please uh, you know please bear with us um she then describes the, the reception camp itself. She describes the actual moments of when the doors are flung open around about lunchtime for the day after the children arrived in, in darkness the night before, and when the children, the young people burst onto Calgarth Estate. And she said there was a deep intake of breath from everybody as to what's going to happen now. And then she said the wonderful words, we, not, we need not have worried. 
immediate friendships were struck up between the locals, between the, the children, the, 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 the laughter, the chatter. And in fact, the impact was such that uh, one of the children was taken to one side, uh, took Marie to one side, and she mentioned it in the journal. And she said to this little Jewish girl, said to Marie, who are these people here? Who are they? And Marie said, no, you're right. These are not Jewish people. These are just friendly British people. And the little girl said, well, this is, these are good people. This is a good country. And the, these, were, these were little gems of insights that, that we, need, we absolutely value from an independent source. And then she describes, and it very much fitted in with the research that we had done, that we'd heard from Ben, from Arek, from you know, Koppel, from many of the boys, that for the first two or three weeks, it, they felt as though they were on holiday. And then uh, suddenly it took a darker turn when they began to get letters from the tracing service to say what had happened to their families, very much as depicted chronologically in the drama. Uh, but here was Marie reinforcing the stories that the boys had told us and reinforcing the stories that the, that the locals had told us. So we had this invaluable insight and she then begins to describe some of the issues that it's fair to say some of the boys and girls have not gone into. She describes some of the, some of the psychological impacts. Um, the, the, the survivors themselves have, have a tremendous resilience. They have defender strategies, but she, from her point of view, which was um, sort of art therapy, psychoanalysis, sort of began to introduce us and give us an insight into what it was actually like at first contact. Um, the, a telling phrase that she uses, that she learned in Windermere, that these young people, we realized that they did not seek pity. Uh, what they required was help, was a leg up. That these young people had, um, they'd survived because of their resilience. And there was a there was a, a toughness about them already, um, and it, it's interesting that she even she mentions again now nowadays we're we're kind of used to the terminology of a, of a secondary trauma, where where therapists can take on the trauma of the people that they're listening to. In those days, it wasn't known about, but she makes mention that the children spoke all the time, incessantly, in the early days. Um, about some of the, the horrors that they, they'd lived through. Um, and she had, at one moment, she describes how she had to go next door into an adjoining room and ask them to move. And then she comes back and reflexively talks to the reader through the journal and said, that sounds, so the, I'll paraphrase, that sounds awful, I had to do that. But you have to understand, one of, one of us had already had a nervous breakdown dealing with them. And I had to protect myself. The stories were, were too much for us. Um, so you have both that reflective side of her, but also the fact that she could explain what was going on. And um, then after Windermere, which was, again, for us, it was absolutely magical. She follows some of the children from Windermere, in a group of them, to a hostel in the south of England. And she lives with a group of the girls there. And she describes life there as them sort of recovering. And then the final section hones in on, she is very close to one, one of the boys who is clearly in a sanatorium somewhere in the south of England. So it's in three sections. It's almost like Windermere is the beginning of a new life and then the continuation and then what happened at the end. Some of it is quite, um, it's quite hard to read, it's fair to say. It's, it's I'm not saying it's unremitting, but it's, it's challenging, but I think it's a very fair reflection on what it must have been or what it was like. And I think, it's, I think people could read it. And I think, I used to work briefly many years ago in the Homeless Persons Unit in London for one of the local authorities. And I could recognize what she was describing in some of the cases I had to deal with many years ago. And I think you could apply them now the sense of loss, disorientation, uh, the type of, the legacy that trauma leaves 
isn't often what people imagine it to be. It's it, the, the damage and trauma in young people, particularly, is very complex. Um, so yes, yeah, so she she emerged into into the Windermere children. I'll wrap up to let Henry start. We had to find permissions. The US Library of Congress were terrific. They said, yes, you can publish it if you get the permission of the families. We then had to track down the families because Marie passed away 30, 30 odd years ago. Um, so it was a bit of a journey discovering Marie's family because she'd had a, a very, very, uh, she'd moved around a lot in her life. Uh, she'd was born in Austria, but she lived in, in Indonesia, in Holland, Paris, the US, then back to the UK. So it's quite a journey. And she actually passed away in London, but these archives came in the Freud archives in the US. It's a very typical story of, of, of sort of, of um, a ruthless kind of intellectual intelligentsia, you know, from the 1930s. And she was clearly restless. And she had a, I think she had a, a strong sense of empathy with these children and what they'd lost. And she had worked, um, all roads with, with the care of the children lead to Anna Freud and, uh, and the, um, the, the Hampstead War Nursery. And, and that's who Marie had known Freud, her family had known Freud. And so her work, she, she worked with children who had been bombed out in the Blitz. Uh, and they were around Paddington and places in London. That was through, through Anna Freud. So clearly this is how she was chosen or, or, or came, to be, came to be in Windermere looking after, after these children. Um, but she did say that there was this telling, she'd worked with children in Berlin, she'd worked with children in, in Paris, but she found the children in London, even by comparison to the survivors in Windermere, the hardest uh, of all to, to work with. The London, which she did at Slunch, were the hardest to work with, the most um, abrasive and aggressive. So she had experience before she came. So yeah, we can pick up on some of these things later. So that, do you want to hand over to Henry now? Do you want to? There we go. Thank you so much, uh, Trevor, as expected. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, can I just pick up on one thing you just mentioned there? Uh, she did, I think I'm right in saying she published a book, didn't she, in 1944, in the middle of the war, called Branch Street, which is a very, again, brutally frank account of her experiences with these bombed out children. And I was reading, doing a little bit of extra homework before this event. And I think I'm right in saying that George Orwell, for example, commented very favorably on the way she was providing insights into the kind of darker underbelly, if you like, of, of London, you know, British society. So a fascinating character. And I hope perhaps we'll have time to hear a little bit more about Mary Panath herself, because there is much more I think you'll agree, I'm sure you'll agree, that could be said, but um, I'm just wondering how best to do much. this. Um, Henry, would you mind if, rather than moving on to you straight away, we perhaps take some questions relating directly to what Trevor yeah. has been saying, will that be okay? Um, yeah. Fine, let me just scroll through quickly and do keep typing them in if you wish. Um, yes, first of all, a very practical question, Trevor, the programme, the Windermere Children and any other relevant material, is it still available anywhere? Um, it's uh, the, the Windermere Children film itself is available on a DVD and I haven't had a date yet but the documentary the Windermere Children in their own words is going to be repeated again through popular demand as they say um, I think on or around Holocaust Memorial Day this year on a BBC channel so watch out for that I haven't had it confirmed yet but the, the yeah for sure but you can you can get the um, the, the the film on, on a DVD, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not aware that it's available on streaming or, or any service like that. Not not yet. And of course, people must go to your fantastically valuable website um, to find out more about the Lake District Holocaust Project and everything else it gets up to. Indeed. Um, right. A lot of um, useful questions here um, from somebody who obviously is not familiar with this history. I'm new to this history from somebody called Pat. Were the children housed at the airboat factory just for processing and recovery or were they employed there? It was purely the, the, the factory was nearby, but Calgarth Estates was the housing scheme specially built for the workers. Um, 
the work that there, there's a telling story that when the children arrived, it was purely for rest and recuperation, recovery. This is why they had psychiatrists on hand, they had uh, art therapists, they had doctors. All things were thrown to the care of the because they didn't know what they were they, they didn't know what they were receiving. Um, but it's interesting because the you will hear people saying the state of the factory, but actually they weren't employed. They were very much Oscar Friedman and Marie Paness. They they were they they come from a different route. A lot of psychotherapy at the time, and art therapy for children was was quite authoritarian. But Oscar and Marie had they'd imbued this. It was a, a burgeoning kind of movement where children were were people in their own right. Um, you see this a little bit in in the works of Janusz Korczak, the famous Janusz Korczak, mm -hmm. the tragic story of him looking after children in. Warsaw and then being and going to the gas chambers with his children, refusing to leave them. He was a remarkable pedagogue and the story is just incredible. But he set up children's councils so they could lack, look after, so they could um, sort of pass judgment on themselves in an orphanage there that he ran. But he, he will describe how in Warsaw, there were many, many street urchins as we call them. And, and the treatment was very brutal. They were hit, they were beaten, they were, they were very, it was a different world. It was very strict. Whereas Oscar and I think Leonard and I think Marie, it's slightly touched on the Winnemere children. They were here to let them run free, let them discover themselves again. Um, but the world, when the children arrived, they didn't quite know where they were. And some of the workers at the factory were still living on Calgary State. And they, came back from the factory, which was on a skeleton staff, blew over all dirty faces, you know. And some of the children were quite spooked by this thing. Oh my God, it's slave labor. They brought us here for slave labor. And <laughs> no, 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 this is just workers at a factory. So th there was an aspect, there was still a working community. The guys there were, st were still working, but our children and, and the teenagers were very much left to their own devices. And remarkably, there was, there was concern that they would not abide by curfews and things. But actually, they did, very much so. Um, but they, they would resist in some aspects of authoritarian, but they, they were very well behaved on that front. Some of the people who came over with them from Poland and Czech Republic, especially their minders, they tended to be the ones that ran away. <laughs> so, but our children were absolutely were, were fine, and yet they were left to, to refine themselves. Okay. Two very practical questions on, on the back of that. One about language. How did Marie actually communicate with the children, as most only spoke, well, mainly Yiddish or, or Polish? Well, she she spoke uh, she spoke German, she, Austrian, and she spoke English. And the when the guys came over, uh, there were some some not Jewish people, but there, there were translators who came. And in the early days, there, was, there were translators on hand. Um, she could speak a little bit of Yiddish, um, but it's quite remarkable thought that, if, if I can tell this story, one of the children, uh, a chap called Maya Hirsch, within three weeks of arriving in Windermere, um, without being able to speak English, watched uh, Seahawk by Errol Flynn at the local cinema. Cinemas were really important to the children, the bright color, you know, and he left the cinema and danced in the street and he said people must have thought I was insane because he'd understood every word in English within three weeks. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were incredibly keen to learn English. It, this, this was, they were being demanded to know English even on the aeroplane flying over. So it just gives an... It, 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 the, 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 they, they had nothing to go back to and they were determined. And, and Marie played a big part in teaching them English. Um, and again, I think the Windermere children kind of hints at that process very much, that they're, they're almost demanding to read English, to, to read and speak English. Mm. Can Is I that okay? interrupt the flow slightly by saying that as you will have noticed, there's been a slight problem with uh, Trevor's bandwidth in the uh, Lake District. Oh. Um, and I did actually send everybody a message asking you if you wouldn't mind to turn off your videos just to increase the likelihood of a better, a better communication. It's mostly fine, Trevor, but just occasionally you go a little bit, a little bit wonky. Um, another question is again, a very practical one. How long, it relates to what you were saying at the very beginning, how long did the children actually stay in Windermere in, on the Calgarth estate? Um, we now know that they, they left in in sort of uh, 
it, they were parceled into groups and, and moved to hostels in Gateshead, Glasgow, um, London, Manchester, Leeds. We now know that the last of them left actually on January the 7th, 1946. Uh, so they were actually here um, upwards, up to about, around about five months. Yeah. Some of the uh, some of the very small children who came were actually they the ones that went to the Bulldogs banks. They left quite quickly after only after a matter of weeks because they needed special care and attention. They couldn't the, the carers couldn't take them from the estate. They they were too um, they put it to be, they had too much spirit of freedom about them. <laughs> they couldn't sort of handle them. So they took them off uh, down uh, to London within two or three weeks. Most of them were leaving in October, November, December. So it was periodically, they were, they were parceled off and went to hostels. Um, and perhaps that's the moment, Trevor, to mention again, I'm sure most of you will know, but the 45 AIDS Society, would you like to just say for those of very, uh, very much. who don't know about it? Um, the 45 AIDS, the, the, the children from Windermere, and then another group arrived in October in Southampton. Another group arrived in Glasgow, another group in Northern Ireland. Eventually, the whole scheme brought over 720 children, young people. The 300 in Windermere was the largest single block, and it was the first group to arrive. Um, but then in, by the 1960s, they formed a friendship, it's fair to say, more than a friendship. They were a family, one enormous family, and they said, Oh dear, we've got a problem again. Uh, does everybody know how to how to uh, turn off the video? Basically, it's fairly straightforward where it says there's the sort of like the camera sort of icon. If you click on that and you should be able to then. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think I, I'm hoping that might make a difference. Yeah. Apologies for this. OK. OK, ca carry on. Yeah. Um, so Ben said it, they set up the 45 age society as a charity. To, to be benefactors back to the country that had welcomed them and they wanted to pay something back to them, but also uh, to be charitable to, to each other, to others who were a fall on hard times. So, and that 45 Age Society is still going strong today. Uh, they have a reunion every year. I've been to a number of them now and, and it's quite tremendous, the, the energy that you, of survival that you get from second generation, third generation. It's a terrific um, energy. Uh, and you can feel the, the, the energy and the friendships that were, that were forged in, in Windermere or in Southampton. You know, th this was their surrogate family. And am I right in thinking that these days they're also quite intent, the second generation members, in helping children now? You know, I mean, they're sort of working with children's charities in the present. Very much so. Yeah, they they Commemoration is one thing, but they they fund educational initiatives. They fund. I think Sir Ben said to me that that because they'd been denied books for a number of years during the Holocaust, that when they arrived in Windermere and ever since, education has been hugely important. I think in the present day climate, a lot of discussion about children missing out on education. I think Ben and the guys are are perfect examples of, you don't, you don't miss something until you don't have it. And they said that when they came to the UK, they were absolutely hungry for books because they hadn't had them. Um, he used to joke with my son a few years ago on the phone, but my son would answer the phone as a 11 or 12 year old. And he would say, so how are you doing at school? Oh, I don't like school, I hate school. You will one day, you will <laughs> you just have the job. But I think it's true. I think, um, I think we need to look after children's education enormously but I, but I've also seen in the boys that if the hunger is there they can overcome and become chief rabbis they, be, they become professors they could become you know Sir Ben Helfgott became the proofreader for Sir Martin Gilbert having arrived here not being able to speak English you know if the drive is there we can overcome this but we do need to really take care of our children's education 
most certainly. Before we hand over to Henry, and I'm sure everybody's looking forward to hearing more about the second generation publishing project, there are a number of questions, quite understandably, that focus back in on Mary Panath and particularly her approaches to art as yeah, therapy. Yeah. So there's somebody, I'm not sure, is it Imogen? Or, um, uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk, first of all. I'd love to hear more about how Panath understood art to function. Was she encouraging the children to paint and draw freely as an inherently beneficial process? Did she discuss the artworks with them? Thank you. Um, she came, she came, she'd been educated under a chap called Franz Cizek um, in Vienna. And he was, he was, a, he was, she learned from him. He, again, in the background of what I said earlier, he was very much, he thought children and children's art was, was pure. It was unadulterated, it was pure creativity, unadulterated by cultural norms. He actually enjoyed children's art and he encouraged two and three year olds, four year olds to, to produce art. And that was an end in itself. It was, it, it was somehow, he started a glimpse into what we should all aspire to be. It's like, almost like a return to Eden. Um, Marie picked up on this, but Marie, Marie had a slightly different view. She, she saw art as a vehicle for therapy as well. She, she let the children, she absolutely encouraged them. She said, she even says in the book that she didn't judge their artwork. There was no quality control on what the children did, but she she could see she just gave them the facilities to do art, and she saw it as a, almost as a metaphor for for rebuilding their lives. So she talks about every time they draw, if they if a house had been destroyed, every time they drew a house and they put people in the house and they were rebuilding themselves and their lives. So she. She sort of picked up and was imbued with what Cizek had said, but she turned it into a therapeutic way. And I th from what we can gather, she did anything she possibly could to facilitate what the children were to do creatively, which could in involve poetry. It was interesting that in Branch Street, that she put on a prefabricated uh, art class workshop and the children came in who'd been bombed out and traumatized. They probably came into this art class with the painting, the drawings and everything around and promptly demolished it. They, they thought it was an intrusion, nothing to do with them. But instead of being dispirited, she thought, what's a different way we can approach this? And she picked up on the adventure playground idea. So instead of bringing them into an art class to, to work with watercolors and paints and oils, she actually had them Building, rebuilding their lives, playing out their traumas using the bomb site where they were growing up and where they were around. And it proved to be incredibly successful. She would try something out and if it didn't work, she would try something else. Very, I think now they call it child-centered learning. She was very much motivated in that way. And she had people who agreed with it, but I can't stress enough why George Orwell thought so highly of her. She wasn't, the way she was working at that time was still, it was still uh, experimental. It wasn't mainstream at all. It, we're, we're talking about a time which is still very institutionalized, you know, and she was sort of free thinking. She picked up ideas from elsewhere, but it, she was, and I think there must have been what is conjecture. She lost her father when she was four years old and she was brought by her mother. And I think these inform how we are in later life. And, and that sense of her, she, there is a sense where she talks about feeling guilty because she couldn't provide the children with enough. So one can talk for a long time about what her motivations may be, but it's actually quite a fascinating insight into how she worked. And she was rare for, she was doing what we would call art therapy, but the term art therapy hadn't been invented then. That came slightly later. So she was involved in something which hadn't quite taken form yet. So you have this wonderful, uh, you know, development. And she's, she's, she's kind of at the forefront of it. Uh, but I don't think she would want praise for that. I think she would, she, she would always just want to do the best for the children. 
She was also a painter. Is that, is that... Yes, no, absolutely. Thank you. She was also a painter herself, and I think that shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah. And there was an earlier question asking yeah. where one might see examples of her work, or indeed the work of the children. And of course, in the book, uh, there are some <laughs> examples. And where, but where else can one go to find out more by way of visual material? Uh, the, the, if you Google Marie Panette, some of her, her, her work does come up online. Uh, we know the family have preserved some of her work. She, she pretty much, for different reasons, she semi-retired from youth work, as she described herself, in the 50s and the 60s. And she pretty well devoted herself to being an artist and a painter. Um, I think there's a telling moment in the book where after she looked after the children in Windermere, she had looked at her reflection in a mirror and was shocked at what was looking back at her. Uh, and actually, if you look, we do know, we know there was a mysterious figure in some of the photographs we have from Windermere. Mm -hmm. and it was a tall, elegant woman. And, and we were quite surprised that it was actually Marie because you can see a woman who is really, um, it's taken its toll. And you can see, and I think it, for her, I think it was a, a semi, she'd done her time. She sort of stepped back because I think there was this very real danger of being traumatized by dealing with these traumatized children. And she does hint at that in the book. Indeed. In fact, there's a question absolutely apropos of that from Cicely. I was wondering if Marie talked about how she managed her own mental health when supporting yeah. the children. And the, the, Cicely is actually herself a clinical yeah. psychologist. So perhaps you can say a little <laughs> bit more about that. Um, she taught, she, she, there was a, she was defending, um, she, had def she was developing defenders. She'd seen the impact. What they talked about um, in Windermere, without going into great detail, uh, what she talks about is the children incessantly in small groups everywhere talking about the death marches and talking about the run up to the end. And she said it was relentless. And we've got a medical, uh, sort of a medical journal book written by doctors at the time from Westmoreland, who gives you an insight. Uh, they said when they first met the children, the stories they were telling them, these children from Prague, they call them, they thought they were exaggerating. But then tellingly by the end of the report, it said, having said we thought they were exaggerating, we sort of realized they weren't. And Marie, I think that you can sense a detachment in the journal when she's when she's writing. She she writes like almost like a, somebody clinically observing, but on occasion you get you get this pain sort of cutting through. You know, you get this insight into I had to protect myself. I felt guilty about pushing these children to one side. I didn't want to let them get close to me. I think Romla Garai's character in in the drama sort of. She's, she's at a distance, but she also kind of wants to embrace them, but she can't. She's, she's a fear for her, her own mental well-being, but she wants to care for the children. But then again, she, so you have all this, this pushing and pulling going on, and you see it continuing when she goes out to London with, with, with the girls in the hostel and with the, the, the single chap at the end. Because they were, they were dealing with... You know, it is you now it's, it's unparalleled what they were dealing with. To deal with one Holocaust survivor, as she does in the final section, is a tough ask. But they were dealing with 300 of varying degrees of, you know, you can imagine trauma, difficulty. We now know that of the 300 that came, around about 80 were ill, ill enough for physical help. Of those, around about 12 or 15 were seriously ill. Now, given that they were all supposed to arrive in, in tip top AA condition, according to the government, you had the, and so they had to be distributed to sanatoriums across the Lake District. And I remember Maya Hirsch, when I pointed out photographs of the guys laughing and joking and winning, he said, Oh, yeah, we were. We said, We were the healthy ones. Mm -hmm. And there are other stories. And, and the journal shines a, a, a big light on that, I think. Um, and very much, I draw my own experiences from when I worked for the Holman's Persons Unit. I could, I could empathize with that. You, you do have these dilemmas, you know, you, I think the term is you have to leave the work at work, but it's very hard sometimes because, you know, it's, it's, it can be tough out there. Marie, I think, um, uh, I think she expresses that very, very well. 
Trevor, I've just seen a message from somebody called Tina that goes as follows. My dear friend Rosemary on screen now, although I can't see her, worked with Marie. Now, is this somebody you know of, you've met, you know? Herself a refugee, losing both presents. She could say- Yes, so Rosemary was one that, that discovered. Well, would Rosemary, sorry, I can't currently see you, but if you- Yeah, Rosemary. Known, um, Susan, is this something, can you unmute Rosemary if you can find her? Yeah, I'm Rosemary, just looking for her now. Yeah, and if you'd I like to say a few words, that would be absolutely wonderful, of course. In the meantime, perhaps I can just quote from another comment from David uh, uh, David Beer. Um, massive compliments to Trevor. I'm sure we'll all endorse this entirely for the lovely respect and insight with which he sees and speaks of the work done to ensure the care and recovery opportunities improvised and created on the spot under great pressure. I assume. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I've got a couple of rosemaries. I don't know which rosemary oh. it is. Oh. Right, would somebody like to type in to say which rosemary it is or we'll try one and if it's not her then we'll try <laughs> the other uh corson rosalind right. corson okay rosemary i've asked you to unmute uh, it's not me it's not it's not me all right okay i'll mute you let's rose uh rosemary corson is the same okay I have asked her to unmute. Oh, this may not work, but uh, let's just give it a, give it a minute. Um, oh. There's a question in the meantime, um, quite a factual one, about the kids who went who ended up elsewhere. Um, yes, where did the children who went to Southampton live? Has research been done into those children? That's an interesting question. because Very much. The, four, the 45 Ada doing that. They stayed in a place called Winters Hill Hall. Um, there are around about 150 of them. Um, and if you look on YouTube, they've just produced, the 45A Society have just produced a film uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Southampton guys arriving. Um, sorry, sorry, oh, is that Rosemary? Oh, I thought I'm mute. Yeah. No, no, we can hear you now, Rosemary. Yeah, yeah. you can Welcome. hear me. Welcome. Hello, Rosemary. Please do say some words, I'm delighted. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, I got such a surprise when I saw Marie Panette on the screen. Very tall woman, very distinguished, very easy to approach, and um, just lovely to deal with. And I think they showed them. Uh, Although it said somewhere that she was not easy. She was so dignified in some way. But I think they all approached her very easily. And um, I don't know if you are aware that Marie also worked in the shelters in London during the war. You know that. And um, in Windermere, it was just wonderful to have her with Oscar Friedman, who was also an absolute genius. Very, very good. And uh, the whole experience of these boys and girls, there were a few girls too, walking freely in Windermere in the woods and not marching. It took some time before they stopped marching, before they're walking and playing. But in the beginning, it was marching. It was a fine, experience for us being there and with them. But I was very young myself and just um, in, on holiday from being a student. And so I learn now from what I hear from Panette 
and from what you say, I learned a lot too, and how they adjusted and became human again. And that's all I want to say. It was a great Thank experience. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Rosemary, I have a very personal question from Robin Shell. Does Rosemary remember any of the children specifically? I wonder if she remembers my own father, one of the elder boys called Gerson Friedman. It's a long time ago, isn't it? Oh, but uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> oh, I, I remember somebody, Morris, Morris, somebody, and I gave my notes to. Uh, um, Israel, uh, Yad Vashem, Yad Vashem, I gave my notes to. That's, that's good to know. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. That's wonderful. Um, just one last very practical thing before we do finally hand over to Henry, as I've been promising to, and that is somebody's just typed in the fact that the Windermere Children is actually available, Trevor, just for your information, on Amazon Prime, so it can be oh, accessed quite, quite easily, so that's good, good to know. So I think we could go on much longer, but I think it is indeed time to hand over to Henry Hochland to yeah. tell us about a little bit about himself and about the publishing project that he and Trevor have embarked on together. Thank you ever so much, Trevor, and over, over to Henry. Thank you. Here, here is, is my account of how I'm here speaking to you today, and it really is a, a family affair. My grandfather fought for the Germans on the Eastern Front in the First World War. We were severely wounded, hospitalized for some six months while recuperating. And he and his wife were milliners and furriers in Königsberg. And in 1936, my father and my grandmother went on a cruise to Palestine with a view to emigrating. It wasn't for them, but on their ship was a spinster, Miss Taylor, who lived on Wimbledon Common with a whole team of servants and she offered, if things got too out of hand in Germany, uh, she offered to Ernest, my father, he could come and stay with her. But while the Nazi stormtroopers sacked a Jew Jewish school on Kristallnacht in 1938, my father, a 15 year old boy, escaped the brown shirts by jumping from an upstory window, journeying to Berlin where the parents of a friend schoolmate lived, he remembered Miss Taylor, the English lady who he and his mother had met on the cruise in Palestine in 1936. She had sent him a picture taken on the trip and he'd, he'd now had her address. Sitting in Berlin in hiding, he wrote to her saying he would like to continue his schooling in England if possible. He was informed by return, by return of post that the Home Office was preparing his papers he arrived in March 1939. And that is the story of how Ernest Hochland came to live in this country. Through hard work and, and graft, he had the opportunity of opening a bookshop in Manchester, which went on to become a substantial and important business. My mother's story is equally relevant. She was born in Poland. The family moved to Romania when she was three years old and eventually made Aliyah to the newly formed State of Israel. Her father sent her to England to collect money owed, whereupon she met my father and three weeks later they were engaged. Also originating from Poland was my father-in-law. Born in Warsaw to a large family, all, all or most of whom perished in the Holocaust. He was imprisoned in numerous camps and miraculously, miraculously survived the last transport from Buchenwald to Theresienstadt. Later on, later on route by the Czech partisans, they, they were liberated. They spent several weeks recuperating there. Collectively, this group was taken to Prague and with others became known as the Boys. In August 1945, they were flown to the UK for rehabilitation. He spent the following months in Windermere. He finally settled in Glasgow, married and had two daughters, Belinda and Sharon. Henry, my father-in-law, never spoke of his past, locked in his trauma. It was an unbreakable silence throughout all the years 
that I knew him. This caused great distress for my wife um, as she searched throughout the years for answers to her many questions about her past. Now we fast forward to a chance meeting she had with Trevor Avery and this was the day everything changed in our family. On our way back from a visit to Glasgow in November 2017, we went via the um, Lake District uh, Holocaust Project in Windermere to listen to a talk given by a Holocaust survivor. At the end of the event, Trevor announced to the audience that a manuscript had been found in Washington, USA, and he was looking for a publisher. Well, he instantly had my attention and an introduction was made. Uh, we knew straight away a strong bond was in the making. I introduced myself. I had a couple of discussions with Trevor and heard nothing until May 2020, when I was informed that permission had been finally given to publish the manuscript. The, the clock was ticking as the challenge to meet the deadline on the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the boys was imminent. Everybody pulled together to make it happen. The first copies landed in my office in November 2020. And I hadn't realised how quickly we had produced the book from receiving the manuscript in May to seeing the finished copies in November was really quite an achievement made only possible by everyone pulling in their part, playing their part. The first generation, our parents, endured the most unimaginable hardships and trauma. They've left a legacy, a baton for us to take and pass to the next generation. As well as passing this on, we need to share our knowledge, understanding, compassion and reconciliation to avoid a repeat of these atrocities. And the principal aim of the second generation publishing company is to help not only Holocaust survivors and their descendants, but also those in other areas of trauma, wherever and whenever it takes place. We need, we need desperately to share their journeys. That's my story. And now I pass you back to Monica. That came truly from the heart, I'm sure everybody, yes, I can see people clapping virtually. Thank you very much, um, Henry. It seems a little bit crass to perhaps concentrate now on practicalities, but would you like to tell us a little bit more about your plans for the future, both short term and longer term? <laughs> it's very different. It's just, we're at the embryonic part of, a, of an idea. And it was really to give people the opportunity to, to be able to um, preserve the little that they have, whether it's uh, two sheets of paper or half a book or videos. And I think it needs really to be uh, for people to come forward and tell us what they've got. Let's see how we can help. And you have, I think I'm right in thinking, you've just set up, haven't you, a means for people to indeed be in touch. If you go to the second generation yes, yes, indeed, indeed. website, which is very easily available on Google, you will see there is immediately on the homepage a link yes. to uh, sign up to the newsletter to be kept informed of your, your progress, indeed. I should also say that if anybody wants to be directly in touch with Henry, I think probably the best bet is to contact, uh, well, it comes through to me, in fact, but to, um, to make contact through the Insiders Outsiders website. And if you go to insidersoutsiders.org, again, easily found, um, be in touch and I will forward your emails to Henry and he will perhaps not immediately but in due course respond because I suspect there will be quite a lot of, of, of interest in the wake of what you've been saying. Does anybody have any more questions? There are lots of appreciative comments as um, I expected. Um, we don't want to get too, let's just see. Um, let's quickly look through. There's a very specific, Gilly, I suspect you should be in touch directly with, with Trevor with your question. We'll leave that one for a side. Um, yes, people with personal direct, not so direct connections, obviously immensely moved and, and you know, valuing your, both your contributions uh, tonight. Um, perhaps that's enough. It's been an emotive experience, I think we'll all agree, and a, a wonderful one. Um, perhaps I could just wind up, of course, by saying a very profound thank you to both Trevor and um, 
Henry and I very much I think like everybody else look forward to seeing how the second generation publishing project evolves with time I will be looking on with great interest and hopefully can be more directly involved as well perhaps I should actually I will just mention Henry with your blessing that I put Henry in touch not very long ago with Arden Halter who as some of you yeah. of you may know is a wonderfully talented visual artist in his own right but importantly for our subject today he is the son of Roman Halter who was one of the boys and Arden has written a very um again almost brutally frank um, account of his own life in relation to his father and his father's history and experiences and I'm delighted to to put them together as Shidduch as uh, Arden himself said that actually will hopefully you know mean that the manuscript gets published it's called The Fire and the Bonfire I've read it it's actually a beautiful piece of writing isn't it Henry and I don't know whether that'll be your next publication but certainly look out everybody for that and uh, if I can just then conclude by saying yes this event has been recorded it will be available both through the AJR website and also the Insiders Outsiders uh, YouTube channel which is gathering in, in richness as we as we go I'm delighted to be able to say and also to mention something that kind of broadens out Mary Panath and her story um, to something yes something something bigger perhaps and more ambitious I've been very fascinated for a long time by the issue of art therapy and indeed also uh, child psychology and the way that the emigres played such a crucial part including you know for example in the realm of toy design in kind of changing the way British society perceived the very notion of childhood and um, I've been in touch with a number of colleagues um, in the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies based at Senate House, as some of you may know, and I'm, well, they're actually having a committee meeting this, this very week, but um, Anna Nyberg, who again, some of you may have encountered, is one of the committee members, and she's very much on my side. She feels that there is a tremendous amount of raw material there, which will repay much further academic and indeed less academic scrutiny to, to look more broadly at this issue of emigres, those who came sought refuge here from Nazi dominated Europe and their immense contribution to, to British society in that particular sphere. And Trevor, I know that you're very much supportive of that endeavor as indeed Henry is. So, so watch this space, there will be news about that as it uh, becomes available on the Insiders Outsiders website. So I think um, we should probably stop there. There are quite a few specific questions, but I think probably uh, we, we should call it a day. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again at other events. Many, many thanks and good night and be safe and happy 2021.